Perfect. So you ready to introduce her? Yeah, everybody. This is Jordana Lennon. She's with the Primate Center. She's Hi. given many, many talks. She's here because we asked for this last year, last spring, when we went through uh, the kind of talks that you'd like to hear. One of them was an update on the stuff at the Primate Center. So you also know that Anna used to um, do similar work with the Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Center, but she's now focusing back solely on the Primate Center. And we have another colleague, Lynn Armitage, uh, who's helping me try to find a speaker for next week. Did everybody get a lineup who wanted a lineup? Okay. And then there's also the Wednesday night at the lab lineup, if you'd like to come to that, or you'll also be able to. Uh, watch that by Zoom or watch it by web stream at biotech.wis.edu slash webcams. And then this is the group here. And then um, can we say hi to Chief Karen? Can chime, the folks at home can chime in? That it be all right to see if they can, uh, let's see, the gallery. So we have Lynn Miguel, hi Lynn, and Emma. Is it Char uh, Charapada and Karen Gunderson are watching at home? All right. And thank you, Jordana. All right. Thank you, Tom and Paul and Kay and everybody for being here. Um, yeah, it's hard to believe I, I'll be at the Primate Center 25 years this November, and I did spend 15 years with the Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Center, so I can answer your stem cell questions too. It just got to be a lot as both research centers have been growing so much to do both <laughs> outreach and news media and all that. Um, so this is a little bit about me. Can everyone see in the back? Great, great. And um, we also, about the Wisconsin National Primate Research Center, yesterday, the student newspaper, the Badger Herald, had a very long story about all the research discoveries at UW-Madison, from Steenbach to DeLuca to Harry Harlow to James Thompson. And they interviewed me for some reason. They, they got me in there um, talking about the primate center. So yeah, that was interesting. So anyway, and how do we get access to that? Who's it's uh, it's on like you can search Badger Herald online, online, mm -hmm. okay. and uh, it was in yesterday, and their stories stay up for a while. It's like an epiphany of research discoveries yeah. or something. It yeah. really covers. The student reporter did an amazing job. It's a really long story, and it covers so much overall UW science. Uh, so yeah, so that was pretty cool to mention. Um, anyway, oh, that's interesting. Try this again. Oh, there we go. So our primate center was established 60 years ago by the NIH, and we're actually one of seven national primate research centers in the country, and we're all affiliated with major teaching and research universities. Um, except for Texas Biomedical Research Institute. Otherwise, Tulane, Emory, UC Davis, um, Oregon Health Sciences University, and some others. And we're Washington, Seattle. We're the only one in the Midwest. <clears throat> so our mission is to improve the health and quality of life through research. So we study human and non-human <coughs> primate biology. <laughs> And we try to come up with better treatments and cures for disease. And we also train a lot of scientists uh, and UW-Madison students, veterinarians. Um, so we have collaborations all over campus with all the schools and colleges that educate and train students. And then my part of it as outreach program manager is to share what we do with the public because for a lot of people, it's really controversial <laughs> to do animal research. So our headquarters are uh, near the Big Ten Pub, if you know where that is. <laughs> we're the southernmost building on campus. And we're actually in five different buildings. We have monkey and researcher space out at the hospital complex because we have a lot of doctors who are translational. They actually work with our monkeys and they work with human patients to test therapies and, and things like that. 
We have a global infectious diseases lab out at Research Park. We'll get into our COVID research later and some other research. And then we have a quarantine and holding facility out at Blue Mount. So that's kind of our locations indicated by the four little monkey faces. They're kind of spread out. And all of our monkeys are housed indoors for obvious reasons in Wisconsin. God, that's not too far off. Yikes. <laughs> I'm still thinking summer. Uh, we do not have eight at our primate center, except for us Homo sapiens, us human apes, but only monkey species that adapt well to captive housing and are really good research models for specific disorders and diseases. And we have our big breeding colony and uh, do not import animals from the wild. So our species are the rhesus macaque, about 1,140. The cinnamon. Has that number been the same for a long time? Yeah, they, they kind of go up and down a little bit because of breeding and research, but they're mostly, the, they've been the same for a few years. That's a good question. And then Cinnamogus macaque, we have about 230. And uh, the common marmoset, about 280. So the first two are old world primates, originally from India. Um, and the island of Mauritius, the Mauritius of Cinnamonus macaque. And the common marmoset is a new world primate um, native to Brazil. So this slide is only in there because I like it. It's a marmoset dad carrying his triplets on his back. It's one of the first pictures I took when I came to the primate center 25 years ago. And we have these monkeys in our lobby. And when we're open again for visitors, you can drop by. If, if you're going to the geology museum or Union South, you can come by and see some live monkeys in our herbarium. So here's a quick snapshot of 100 years of research discoveries with non-human primates. Some of these might sound familiar. Um, in the 1950s, my dad, who graduated from medical school here, um, had to work as a resident at the height of the polio epidemic. And so he was always telling us about that. And of course, I worked for him in the 70s when um, polio was under control, but uh, he still had patients getting very sick with um, asthma and chickenpox and lupus and things like that. So we've come a long way. Um, but anyway, these advances all depended on mostly rhesus and other macaque <clears throat> monkey research. Can you guys see all those? <laughs> I don't have to read them. And please excuse my cough. I'm not sick. I just have lupus myself. So I have a chronic uh, lung inflammation and joint pain. That's why I'm sitting down. But fortunately, I'm doing okay. <laughs> um, one of our most famous scientists in the past was Dr. Harry Harlow. And he did some controversial separating infants from their mothers to study their behavior if they choose comfort over food. And um, this was groundbreaking controversial research in the 1950s and 60s. Dr. Harlow became our first director of the Primate Center and he has trained countless, countless of students who have gone on to be among the world's leading psychologists. So the legacy actually of Harry Harlow was that he got people thinking about hands-on infant rearing, touching, smelling, those olfact olfactory cues, the hormones released by sense of touch, and um, got people, the parents especially, to spend more hands-on time with their infants. Because it's hard to believe that that wasn't always the case. It was sterilized nurseries, orphanages, no touching, no holding, that would you know make your baby sick and give them germs. And now we know that it, the opposite is true. It promotes normal, healthy brain development. To hold and touch and breastfeed and smell your baby and let them smell you. And now, uh, fast forward to now, we have brain scan, uh, um, more sophisticated brain imaging techniques that prove Harlow's original uh, experiments were right, that the brain does develop normally with this kind of hands-on parenting. Um, we're also known for the Wisconsin card sorting test, um, the gold standard of cognition studies for humans and animals, choosing shapes and 
in colors. The rhesus monkeys are smart enough to do this, and we still use it on them for different studies today. And this was really important because this is a test that's patented and used all over the world in psychological studies. And it helps diagnose things like early Alzheimer's, um, ADHD, attention uh, deficit disorder. So these are some of the legacies of primate center research. Some more research highlights have been, has anyone heard about our aging and calorie restriction study over the last 30 plus years? Giving monkeys fewer calories, but without malnutrition. And um, it's been a long-term study, but here are some of the, over the decades, some of the findings from this. Um, healthier, younger looking monkeys, like the two in the photo, they've since passed. The last monkey on the study died um, earlier this year. Um, they're truly old when they get in their 20s and captive rhesus can live to about 40. But anyway, um, they're the, they were the same age when that picture was taken. And the one on the left was calorie restricted and the one on the right was allowed to eat what it normally would. So it's hard to do this sort of research in humans and control their, not give them malnutrition or kind of starve. Um, but in the monkeys, you can control it and balance their diets and find out that they're just a lot healthier all around. And less osteoarthritis, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So this, the idea of this study isn't to get people to do this diet but to study these monkeys, and there's lots of um, data that still needs to be analyzed to find out how CR works at the cellular and molecular levels, and maybe someday come understand it and come up with some memetics for um, helping treat these diseases a little better. We had a ways. speaker in here about seven, eight years ago. Oh, and he was retired, and I think he headed that project. I don't Dr. Know. Rick Weindrick? Did you have Dr. Weindrick? He was the first one. No, lead that's it. not the right name. Sterling Anderson. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of People researchers are, from the Institute on Aging, Primate Center. And yeah. He gave us a report on the research for those who have been restricted diets. Yeah. Oh, from the people. Oh, I understand. Yeah, from the human. So, and then another big area, our global infectious disease research. And we have spent a lot of years um, doing the basic pathology, virology, immunology studies to establish rhesus monkeys as a good model for um, better understanding and uh, helping with vaccine development and better treatments, medicines for HIV, Ebola, dengue, Zika virus, and now COVID-19. So last uh, February, we started working on the rhesus monkey model of COVID-19. And because we quickly and su successfully established the rhesus macaque as a good model for human disease, the big pharma companies then realized they could start developing and testing their vaccines in rhesus monkeys. So after several dozens of rhesus monkeys were tested last summer, and then several hundreds of thousands of humans were tested in clinical trials, here we are today, and we have this vaccine. And um, I just got my booster shot last week as a you know, compromised person. So um, I'm feeling okay with that, and that uh, makes me feel good. Um, so let's see, what else? Oh, yeah, and um, the other thing about COVID-19, I don't want to spend all day on it, but um, we uh, collaborated with the NIH and other research facilities because we had a lot of the experts on genome sequencing and virology and immunology, but we did not have a biosafety level, an animal biosafety lab three, level three to do these infectious studies on a easily spread virus. Well, now we got an NIH grant and we are building one starting next month. We're actually renovating existing facilities that we have to do our own studies. Uh, on COVID-19, on SARS-CoV-2, the virus. Now, people might ask, well, we have vaccines, why do we need this? We still need to keep ahead of variants. Maybe the vaccines will have to change. We'll have to come up with better vaccines. We also have to study and perhaps come up with better interventions and treatments for long COVID. So the symptoms of that, like the heart trouble, the loss of uh, taste and smell, there's so much we don't know. So we'll continue to research COVID-19. And HIV AIDS is still a pandemic. So 
1.7 million new cases of HIV in 2019, 38 million people infected with it. So we are still working on that. Um, one thing we discovered was um, our research collaborating with the University of Minnesota, because it's all about collaborations often. Um, we came up with a uh, vaginal gel that prevents the transmission of HIV from mother to newborn baby during birth. So that was a big success. And then uh, now we're using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. You've probably heard of all the new gene editing techniques to modify immune system cells grown from stem cells to replace, to create replacement immune systems that would be resistant to HIV infection. So this is one of our biggest labs working on that. And then uh, neuroscience is a big area. Th this is such a big area. I know this is a really dense slide and I apologize for that, but there's just so much we're working on. Um, better treatments for mental illness, ADHD, um, menopause disorders, eye diseases. Um, now next week, I believe we're gonna have, you're gonna have someone from Dr. Marina Emborg's, Emborg Parkinson's lab talk about her weeks. research. What? That's in two weeks. Two weeks, she's gonna talk about Jeanette, um, a postdoc is gonna come in and she was highlighted a couple of years ago as one of two or three students at the Camp Randall graduation by Chancellor Blank as one of the promising research students that um, has come out of our Parkinson's program. So Jeanette Metzger will be here. Um, so there's just been so much, and you can always go to our website, primate.wisc.edu, and we try to put our news right up at the top and easy to find uh, some of our latest discoveries. So, so yeah, it kind of a quick summary of all that is a lot of these depend on brain imaging, uh, CT, um, fMRI, PET scans. And so the studies with most awake non-human primates and humans, again, a lot of our researchers are doctors and they're translational. Um, the, one, the picture on the left is, upper left is a little tiny marmoset up at the Wimmer complex, the hospital complex area, getting a scan. And then there's a human, you can see their feet sticking out on the bottom. So lots of comparative studies going back and forth to make sure we know what we're learning in the monkeys, we can look for it in humans go back and test new therapies on the monkeys and just learn about how the brain functions overall when it's healthy and when it's not. So, um, and a while back, one of the UW hospital physicians refined his, uh, an example of what I was talking about, the translational medicine. He refined his deep brain surgeries techniques, his deep brain stimulation by, um, perfecting uh, his placement of his electrodes in the monkeys and then going back and forth between monkeys and human patients, as you can see, to treat movement disorders such as cervical dystonia. And now this is used in Parkinson's a lot, deep brain stimulation. So levodopa drug doesn't always work forever in people with Parkinson's. Um, DBS, deep brain stimulation is being used for. And uh, there's some other advances in Parkinson's I'll tell you about soon. Another big area is reproduction and development. And going back to 1984, the world's first uh, in vitro fertilization rhesus monkey was born at the primate center. And so this really was a breakthrough. It helped scientists continue to improve IVF. Because at the time, um, and I didn't know this, I thought it was interesting, the success rate for in vitro fertilization wasn't much higher than natural fertilization. It was like 25% versus 22, and now it's much better. So even though Louise Brown, the world's first uh, test tube baby had already been born in 1977, we still wanted to follow this long-term and see if we could have better techniques for doing it and making it more successful. Um, so lots of pregnancy and reproduction and development research. We have been working on understanding and finding better treatments for cytomegalovirus, listeria. These are things that can be very detrimental to your fetus if you catch them, if you get infected when you're pregnant. And uh, preeclampsia in pregnancy. Ted Golos has been around for a long time working on that. And then we have one of the world experts, David Abbott. He's been around for 30 or more years studying polycystic ovary syndrome. 
And he has gained so much insight into the causes, early identification, diagnosis. He works with physicians around the world in understanding PCOS using a monkey model. He learned a lot about it in detail to help inform the human research. And he was just awarded um, the PCOS Society's biggest award, international award, for his contributions to better understanding and treating polycystic ovary disease. How common is that? About one in 10 women have it. So it's pretty common. It's a lot like a lot of things people don't talk about, you know, and it's got multi symptoms. So it can often be misdiagnosed. Um, infertility is the biggest hallmark, but also you can have weight gain, um, excess hairiness, uh, you know, depression can come with it, and other uh, symptoms. It's kind of like endometriosis is another women's health area we're studying. And that's when you don't hear about that. I think a lot of women suffer from endometriosis. It's a painful uh, uh, reproductive disorder. So here we are, stem cells. And uh, Jamie Thompson has to be the man that we mentioned here. He was the first in the world to grow embryonic stem cells in monkeys. And then with that knowledge, repeated the feat with human cells using leftover unwanted donated frozen embryos with patient consent from each in vitro fertilization clinics. So embryonic stem cells came from lab fertilized embryos and did not come from abortions or miscarriages. There is fetal tissue research at UW-Madison, um, but embryonic stem cells did not come from um, fetal tissue or abortions. So they were fertilized in the labs. Now, and, that wasn't true at first, was it? What? Yeah, they, 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 did, they did come from, from, from aborted. Uh, no, they yeah. all, all of the human embryonic stem cells, well, the monkey ones came from flushing out, like a monkey outpatient procedure, just flushing an embryo out of a monkey. And um, it had to be at like uh, five to seven days when the stem cells formed. And so by using these donated unwanted uh, lab fertilized embryos, they could, they could get them at five to seven days, but they had to destroy the embryo um, to get the stem cells out. So even though those embryos had never been in a woman's body, they were still controversial. Although Jamie Thompson's famous quote when he was testifying to the state and US Congresses was, hundreds of thousands of these embryos end up sitting frozen in labs, never used, eventually discarded. I can't see how throwing them away is better than studying them to learn about cell development and the origins of diseases and uh, growing cells from them to test drugs on before you need animals and people. So that is how that started. And then people like to say the same scientist who started the controversy sort of ended it 10 years later when he used his knowledge, the genetic knowledge from growing the human embryonic stem cells to learn how to take a mature dividing cell, like from you or me, a skin cell, put it in a lab dish and using the right growth factors and chemicals and genes introduced into it, turn back your cell's clock to make your cell like a blank slate, embryonic-like stem cell, but without the need to destroy a lab fertilized embryo. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what's being used. Now, both cells are in research and clinical trials um, for diseases um, because it's been 25 years. So also online, there's an article I wrote for the School of Medicine and Public Health Alumni Quarterly Magazine this year. This spring, it's called 25 Years of Amazing Discoveries. And it's sort of, in four pages, sums up the last 25 years of stem cell research at UW-Madison and how it's kind of started in the monkeys and now it's coming back to the monkeys and other large animals for treatments. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time. What part. other places are known for this similar research? Um, California is a big hub of stem cell research because they, unlike Wisconsin, which does not have state funding for the research, we use federal funding. California passed a resolution early on that the taxpayers approved to support some state funding. So the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine is big, UW-Madison, it's kind of become the new era of science and medicine, that and gene editing, and it, 
Minnesota, Michigan, uh, every major research university, I would say, does stem cell research, except in those states where um, embryonic step, stem cell research is still against the law, but other kinds of stem cell research are done. And all of it kind of speaks back and forth. Science speaks back and forth. So here are some of the, the uses that we talked about, kind of a review. I also give this talk for teachers. So we have a TED Ed, what are stem cells for their middle school and high school students uh, curriculum and quizzes and things that they can uh, share. So if you look, if you look up uh, TED Ed, what are stem cells by Craig Cohn, you get a really great uh, curriculum on that. And we updated it, it was 2013 and Craig and I updated the curriculum in 2018. It's still fairly current, pretty good. So really quick, kind of the hit parade, what were some of the cells that UW-Madison researchers were the first in the world to grow from stem cells? Um, motor neurons, and can you guys see at the bottom, I've put the diseases or disorders that that discovery is impacting. We already have stem cell therapies for spinal cord injury in clinical trials. Lou Gehrig's disease is a little tougher. Where am I going? Oh, uh, dopaminergic neurons, Marina Emberg lab. And uh, Jeanette will talk more about her specific research area. Is she on campus? She is, yeah, she's at the Primate Center. And um, this March, there was a big news release. Dr. Emberg and Dr. Su Sheng Zhang, who did the other neurons, they um, were able to grow dopaminergic neurons from a monkey's skin cells by turning back the clock and do a you know, blank slate stem cell, turning it into a dopamine neuron. So they did an autologous same monkey transplant into the brain and into the brains of monkeys that um, they induced Parkinson's in with chemicals that give them Parkinson's disease. And the stem cell treatment that they perfected reversed the symptoms in all of these autologous transplant monkeys. It was so successful that they are right now applying for human clinical trials for this stem cell Parkinson's treatment. So fingers crossed on that one. First in the world to grow blood cells and immune cells, Dr. Slipman at the Primate Center. And they're not just in a vacuum, you know, they're Primate Center, but they also have School of Medicine and public health appointments, you know, like cell and regenerative biology department, um, pathology. Jamie Thompson's now still as a primate appointment, but he's the director of regenerative biology at the, the Moorbridge Institute for Research. And then this one excites me because I've been hospitalized with lupus nephritis. Um, they had to treat that, so my kidneys didn't fail. And so this is really cool because we are transplanting new immune systems, new bone marrow grown from stem cells into monkeys so that we can prevent graft versus host disease in mismatched kidneys. Because, you know, it's hard to get kidney donors and other organ transplant donors. So this would be a really big thing if we can um, generate immune systems from stem cells for patients that will accept a mismatched kidney. And this is a uh, was done in our monkeys by the head of surgery, Dixon Kaufman, and it is also now in human trials. And the first in the world to grow heart muscle cells, cardiomyocytes from stem cells. That's a single heart muscle cell. It beats, they all come together and they beat in a lab dish. It's really cool. They know what to do. Stem cells. What, what are, they're, they're injecting those into, into hearts now? Yeah, that's in clinical trials at UW Health and other places. Well, what they do is they grow the, the heart muscle cells. They put them on this little dissolvable raft of um, other proteins and things. It looks like a little contact lens. Dr. Amish Ravel at UW-Madison, Tim, are doing that. The stem cells float and they're patched onto the heart. And the little raft that, trans, that carries them out of these gels and proteins dissolves and the, the stem cells know in the right microenvironment where they are on that heart. They know to start regenerating healthy heart muscle tissue. The key is this has to be done right after a heart attack before scar tissue forms. The cells, the cells can't regenerate through scar tissue. 
but for acute heart attacks, this is showing promise at UW. And all clinical trials usually involve lots of institutions around the world, not just one, as you know. So um, this is exciting. And uh, blindness, um, David Gann at UW grew retinal cells first in the world, and those are already in human treatments for um, macular degeneration and other forms of uh, vision loss. So it's really pretty amazing. Um, but I talked about a hit parade. So, wow, you know, this is all great, but does biomedical research always lead to treatments and cures? Um, so this is another text heavy slide, um, but we just like to always emphasize that even with all these breakthroughs, Throughs. We've been around 60 years and a lot of it comes from our basic research and it takes a lot of time and a lot of studies, you know, like, like the building blocks of the building, each little block you don't notice that they all build up to make the big wow. Um, the average medical breakthrough takes about 30 to 50 years. So stem cell research has been relatively quick and a lot of our primate research on global infectious diseases seems really quick, but even these lightning speed COVID-19 vaccines were based on 30, 40 years of studying similar messenger RNA viruses like Ebola, like HIV, like Zika. So we've been working on vaccine methods for those and we had a lot of that groundwork done so we could inform the pharma companies on these methods for making uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. And then on the bottom, I give an example of something that didn't work. Uh, a new Parkinson's therapy that worked really well in rats was then funded so we could try it on our monkeys. It was a kind of a cellular therapy. And it uh, seemed to work, but then often you have a few monkeys in an early study, you have to, this is hard to get your mind around, but you often have to euthanize the monkey even if something works because you wanna make sure it didn't adversely affect any other cells, tissues, and organs. Unfortunately, this GDNF therapy caused pancreatic lesions in these monkeys. So the funding was halted. It did not go to clinical trials and Dr. Emborg published her negative results in uh, a journal so that other people would know if they're studying this, what was going on. And maybe this wouldn't, this cannot advance to human clinical trials. So the negative results are really important too. And then finally, a lot of people don't know about our conservation wildlife research. And so we funded a lot of studies in the wild to help better understand and work with governments and students and teachers to um, promote preservation and conservation uh, education involving endangered primates. Like a big one is try to work with locals and give them jobs. Um, in game management and tracking animals and doing studies instead of um, hunting them, bush meat. Uh, also trying to educate kids not to keep monkeys as pets while the monkeys do not make good pets and get really stressed out and, and that doesn't, it isn't good for them. Um, we also try to study habitat destruction and how it affects primates. Some adapt, some don't. So um, <coughs> a lot of this is just working with people to educate them on trying to fight um, deforestation and things like that. Is it going well? No, but we, we keep trying. We keep trying, we can't give up. We have an orangutan researcher who's new at the Primate Center. And he's done some genetic work that has shown that zoos and sanctuaries have been introducing orangutans into the wrong jungles in the wrong countries even, thinking they're all the same species and they're not. So when there's, um, interbreeding of the wrong subspecies of orangutan, you get heart problems and more infections and it just isn't a good idea. So he's trying to educate zoos and sanctuaries on doing genome sequencing on their orangutans so they know the origins of these subspecies. Are they Indonesian? Are they Bornean? For um, proper reintroduction back into the wild. So we've uh, studied a lot of hormones in the wild monkeys as well and uh, learned a lot about how to manage them in um, zoos and sanctuaries and understand them in the wild. So we've discovered really tiny environmental changes like uh, 
a certain tree that is cut down can really mess with the murky monkeys. So some countries have uh, funded volunteers to replant certain kinds of trees for these animals so they can thrive. These murky monkeys, they're very social and peaceful in uh, Brazil. Here's the orangutans. That's one of Graham, Dr. Baines's uh, beautiful orangutan pictures. So I forgot that was a new slide I put in there and I talked about it before we got to the slide, but you know, I'm always updating the talks. So this is the new one. And so this is kind of what it boils down to. Um, we have provided this data that wouldn't be available otherwise. We could take wild samples back to our lab and analyze them for stress hormones and diseases and things in monkey pee and poop, you know, and find out what's going on with these wild animals. So we are trying to help governments enforce species and habitat protection laws, but it's it's very difficult road ahead. We involve communities in conservation, as I mentioned. And we also raise money for conservation. Dr. Karen Stryer on campus, the world's leading expert in the Miraki, has a pro Progetto Miraki um, to help raise money for conservation for them. And uh, there's a picture of them up on the left and Karen down on the lower left in the field. She's now president of the International Society of Primatologists. And just some of the photos of the species we've provided grants to slow loris on the upper right, um, the orangutans, the golden langur of India in the lower left. And then one of the communities with our scientists, Bob Horwich in the middle that we funded a grant to, um, to study the golden langur. So we have 23 scientists with core research support, but we collaborate with hundreds of more hundreds of others around the world. And we already talked about these, these major areas. So just a summary of our four major research areas, but we do research that doesn't always fit in neatly to all of these either. There's so much overlap. Global infectious disease we talked about, energy metabolism and chronic disease like um, aging stuff, menopause, calorie restriction, all the neuroscience work, mental illness. Ned Kalin has, is testing a new promising gene therapy for um, reprogramming neurons that um, are excitable and cause anxious anxiety and um, mental illness. So that's, that's an exciting um, area to follow, Ned Kalin's mental illness research and anxiety research. And then uh, we talked about some of the pregnancy and women's health issues, regenerative and reproductive medicine. Here are our scientists, our core scientists. I just thought I'd throw this up there. So I've known them all, I know them all. They're so great. I love them because they all do outreach too. Um, not always easy, you gotta book them ahead of time, but um, they do outreach, they help with outreach. And um, that includes news media interviews. Like our COVID-19 scientists have been very busy, David O'Connor and Tom Friedrich, Shelby O'Connor, talking to the international news media about our research. So that's been real busy area lately. Um, and then the teaching, undergraduates, graduates, clubs. There's Dr. Dave Abbott on the right, our polycystic ovary disease scientist teaching his undergraduate zoology course. I think he's retiring and moving to France next month. Like, don't go. Miss <laughs> these guys, they're like family. Um, and then we have about 225 support employees in all these divisions. You, nobody thinks behind the scenes, you kind of picture the research lab, but all the animal services people, the vet people, um, the IT people, operational services, HR, we're really our own big bricks and mortar NIH funded uh, research center. Some of our employees, even on the lower right, we have our own shop that builds um, research apparatus and specialized cages and toys and enrichment things for the monkeys to, to keep them busy. So what's up with the monkeys? This is the last part. Um, and if you have any questions, you can ask me now, or we can just show you some behind the scenes pictures of our animals first. Well, keep going. Okay. Is the Wisconsin state legislature limiting the badger research at all? 
Um, the Wisconsin State Legislature uh, isn't limiting the primate center's research. Um, all of our research is funded by the National Institutes of Health. We're a federally, federally funded research center, but um, states can pass laws, you know, banning certain types of research. Um, so they don't fund, the state doesn't fund our research, but they could prevent it if they wanted to. Um, so, so far, embryonic stem cell research in Wisconsin is legal, field tissue research is legal, um, has to be done under strict, strict oversight and um, with all the committees and federal oversight. And then our primate center mostly is overseen by the United States Department of Agriculture enforcing the Animal Welfare Act. And we do stem cell research. I think we have two scientists doing embryonic stem cell research, Igor Slipfin, the blood guy, blood stem cells. And then of course, Jamie Thompson. So here's our behind the scenes stuff. And um, this kind of, I just mentioned this, but lots of layers of regulation and laws and oversight so um, if we have a violation like water to a monkey's cage is accidentally clogged by who knows what hair or feces and we don't check it on time and the monkey goes without water, we have to pay a fine. And almost in every single case, we find it, we report it to the USDA and they fine us and we pay the fine. We're not perfect, but we strive to be. With 1,600 monkeys, sometimes things go wrong. And like everyone else, we're understaffed and our animal care people are working so hard in these hot rooms with these tropical species. And to me, they're like heroes, um, but it's not an easy job. But we have great, great care and great dedicated caring people, but sometimes there are violations. The animal rights people jump on all of them and throw them out there and write to Congress saying, well, we should be shut down. Um, sometimes I wish they care as much about people in nursing homes and other places, honestly, but that's their thing. Um, animal rights issues are a big deal. We have to, to deal with those and they give us an opportunity to set the record straight at least. So this is what our animal care people and vets provide to uh, our animals. Most are housed socially with other monkeys, but with our HIV research, they have to be singly housed for different experiments. Um, because you know, if you have an infectious disease, you have to be housed on your own. And um, they get dental care, exercise, treats like fresh fruits, healthy treats. And the marmosets like uh, wax worms a lot. <laughs> they also like insure shakes. <laughs> so Dry's experimenting with different treats that are healthy for them. What is the regular diet of the monkey? Um, they get like a chow, like used to be Purina, and now it's Harlan Tech Lead. It's just a pellet, a dry food, like dog food, that has a real good balance of carbs, proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals. And then we supplement it with fruit every day, like apples, kiwis, oranges, watermelon, um, and some treats, mini marshmallows, peanut butter, but we have to be really careful with those because of their teeth, of course, and, and they can, they're prone to obesity like humans. So here's a little behind the scenes um, in a surgical ward on the left. It's like a main surgery suite at the hospital, but smaller. Um, and then you can handle the monkeys, the marmosets, but you have to use big raptor gloves because they do bite and scratch. The rhesus are often either sedated for a major procedure because they're 10 times stronger than us. They have canines this long, they can bite and you don't want that to happen. So. And a lot of our animal care staff had farm backgrounds, you know, working with large animals when they came here and others are trained. So then they're monitored before they go back to their home cages. Most of the research is non-invasive and it's getting to be more and more that way, like the brain scanning, but they're still with infectious diseases and a pandemic that's now exceeded the 1918 pandemic and deaths. Um, you have to, we do. To trade off, we do sacrifice animals as few as possible to answer a scientific question. And so this is a little bit about the euthanasia. A lot of the animals just live a really long time and they become really old and then 
they just pass on. So that's a lot of our loss too, is we kind of have a monkey old folks home. We've been around so long. And then some are euthanized for research. And a lot of the tissues and organs go to other research and teaching universities. Um, so these animals really serve our society in so many ways. And we're grateful to them. We train them with treats, you know, to stick out their hand for a blood draw, like you train a dog. We can train them for research procedures, giving them a banana after an ultrasound. And that cage is, is just holding the monkey in place so it doesn't turn around and bite the technician while she's doing an ultrasound. So there's a reason to gotta protect the staff, not just the monkeys. So just some of that. And we have a whole unit that is kind of involved with keeping the monkeys happy. Toys, games, food puzzles, cage furniture, and rotating things around, swimming pools. So keeping things interesting uh, for the monkeys because they're really smart. That one's got a mirror. It's looking at people coming in the room. That one's chewing fruit out of a frozen ice block. Halloween pumpkins. Um, some monkeys playing with some food puzzles, some plastic cups where they pick foods out and manipulate them. AstroTurf, they love picking every last mo molecule of seeds and peanut butter and yogurt out of there. A nursery while a mom's recovering from mastitis or a C-section. We have nurseries and then put the monkeys back in with the moms. Oh gosh, popcorn, shampoo, they can smell, all sorts of fun things we've rotated through there. And then we don't allow the public in because we just have way too many people in there. We've served 97,000 people individually with our outreach programs, but there's not enough space and you have to be trained to work with the animals and we just have to be really careful with uh, public admission into our smaller animal areas. So. It's all about safety for staff and the monkeys and not stressing them out. They know and trust their caretakers, but every stranger would raise their cortisol levels and they wouldn't be good for themselves or for research. I thought I heard you say, when we open again. Oh, to visitors, our lobby. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, we, we often have school groups in our marmoset lobby and we do programs with them. And I, I'm hoping that'll happen soon, I really do. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. We have to protect our staff because we got to have people healthy to take care of the animals, not just healthy for themselves. So we do school visits, we go to schools and science festivals. We give a lot of handouts like this bookmark I made. That on the bottom there, that's my dad on the right and my son when he was three. You know, if you, if you have your family post for pictures, you don't have to get photo permissions. <laughs> so that works out well. Um, yeah, and then we just try to do a lot of this and it's fun to be back here doing a talk after a year and a half. And so thank you so much for coming. I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, this was our big story. I mean, Aaron Jones is really the big story, right? But um, the second one back in March, stem cell therapy reverses Parkinson's symptoms in monkeys. And that was our probably one of our biggest breakthroughs this year as reported in the Wisconsin State Journal. Um, but I'm excited about the Packers too. They, they won, so yay. Um, and then I'm gonna just breeze through our website, but this is what it looks like. And you can get news and COVID news, journal articles. And we do have responses to animal rights um, lies down there. If you wanna see what they're saying, what they're claiming and how we respond to it, try to be very transparent and set the record straight on what we're doing. So. Um, they have been, PETA has been spreading the lie that there were no animals used in developing the COVID-19 vaccines. The exact opposite is true. But I just feel like, well, they have nothing to lose by claiming this to fit their agenda. We're the ones that have to prove it, right? So we've written letters to the editor in the state journal and responding to their ads and all that, our directors. I'm going to breeze through this, but it's all on our website. I call people back if they have a question, if they're respectful. I want to talk to people and hear from the public. We have a website for all the primate centers. 
And uh, I even wrote an article on my disease and how I'm alive because of our primate center's research on lupus, prednisone, mycophenolate, and mocktail, and hydroxychloroquine. Hans Solinger, that name sound familiar? He um, wrote an article and sent it to me and he said, yeah, we absolutely um, worked on, you know, the kidney organ UW solution and also the medications that I take every day to save my life, as do kidney transplant patients. You um, said hydroxychloroquine? Hydroxychloroquine I take. It's a repurposed anti-malarial drug mm -hmm. that has shown effective in treating lupus along with Cellcept, a cancer immunosuppressant. So I take thousands of milligrams of meds every day and they work. So I'm really happy about that. So I want to tell my story. I think we hear a lot of stories from the animal rights people, but patients need to tell their stories. Isn't so, that drug being used for COVID now? It is not. It is not. No, it is not. There was one or two small studies about it over a year ago, but they didn't really pan out to be a standard of care treatment. But that's a good question. Um, so then remember the kid on the bookmark? Your son. There he is. He just graduated from UW School of Nursing, got a job as an RN downtown Denver and moved out there a few weeks ago. And my work is finished. 29 <laughs> years of raising kids. They're both making more money than me now. They could support me. So I'm very, very happy. You wish. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Yeah. We so. know that story. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we're out of time, but thanks for asking questions throughout the talk. And um, anybody have a question or two yet? Yeah? Yeah, I know you've got all these regional labs. Is, is, there, is the federal government or NIH itself have its own primate lab? Yes, uh, they have one at Fort Detrick uh, research, Integrated Research Facility in Maryland. And that's, we collaborated with them because they had a BSL-3 lab and they could infect the monkeys that they had with COVID. There's one in Poolsville. So yeah, we've collaborated with NIH facilities on the East Coast. And then we are an NIH facility, but yeah, we're with the university. Oh, yeah, I didn't have the, NIH is so huge that, um, but they are mostly in uh, Bethesda. Their campus, Maryland. Yeah, I had another question too. I was there was very high level up there, kind of reminded me if you thought they had during COVID. Um, obviously, a lot of the psychological stuff that serves in the monkeys that like human applications. Does Harlow or any of his associates do things with like, reintegrating people after they've been segregated for a long time? I think my kids coming back to school and need to be socialized. Oh, that's a really good question. I know like with the monkeys, Harlow tried to reintegrate them socially and some of it worked and some it didn't. Um, you know, that was so long ago. I think it was more what his research between when he did his findings and now we have this modern brain imaging. It was more like um, pediatricians took note and like Dr. Spock, remember him? He started writing these books about hands-on parenting more. I mean, I, I look at Turner Classic Movies and there's all these movies where there's somebody who has a nanny and the, the parents aren't really holding the baby. Well, it's more like she says she's pregnant and all of a sudden the next scene, the baby's already born, you know? Um, but I think those old movies reflect what it was like for wealthy um, families in America who could afford to hire a nanny. Um, other families that weren't as wealthy or didn't have this great health care. Yeah, kids, as we know, got sick. There was all sorts of pandemics, typhoid, and diseases. Um, but I don't know that answer to your question um, about anything Harry Harlow specifically did himself other than his research in the lab. And then he died fairly before his time. He had depression and alcoholism and um, so he was our director in 1961, our first director. And I never met him. I started in 96 and he was long gone. But it's his students that have gone on to do more direct psychological studies and students research that has affected. Like one really great example is uh, Seth Pollack at the Wiseman Center. Um, just all the childhood development studies going on. And he um, did hormone analysis based on 
our primate center scientist, Tony Ziegler's hormone analysis and marmosets, they together came up with a very precise assay that could measure tiny changes of bonding hormones in marmosets called oxytocin and vasopressin. And then that marmoset test was developed. It was so accurate and sensitive. Seth Pollock used it on children at the Weizmann Center. Um, and in a research study, he studied orphans from Bosnia that were adopted by families in Milwaukee. And they weren't bonding and they were cringing because they had been abandoned and raised in orphanage type situations. They measured these kids against healthy kids and they find, found out they had these significantly lower levels, but that we were able to finally measure for the first time. And they said, there's a scientific reason why your kids aren't hugging you and reciprocating. And that was one of UW-Madison's biggest news releases. Right. So yeah, and, and parents were calling from all over the world saying, thank you for this research. I thought it was me. I thought I wasn't doing something right as a parent, as a um, you know adoptive parent. And now I know it's chemical, brain chemical. A lot of that came from Harry Harlow being the first to get people to think about brain chemistry and how to measure it and find out reasons for early childhood development issues. Tom. Karen Gunderson at home says, do the research monkeys spend their entire lives in the research facility? And then a uh, second question, what type of radio and TV do the monkeys prefer? Oh, oh interesting question. Know. Yeah, they do spend their entire lives at the center. Although we have um, transferred monkeys with other primate centers. We in the past donated some to sanctuaries when in Texas, uh, namely when their um, projects were over. We had monkeys at the zoo. We donated the stump tail macaques to Texas Sanctuary. Um, but most of them do. They're owned by the NIH and we take care of them through their whole lives. Often it's stressful to transfer a monkey and take it out of its room where it knows, smells, knows the caretakers and other animals. What was the other question? Do the research monkeys spend their entire lives in the research facility? Or the radio TV. Sorry. Yeah, they prefer, Reese's monkeys prefer cartoons and they like videos of chimpanzees for some reason. They found, and they like radios, um, different kinds of music. Chuck Snowden, a psychologist, has studied what animals, what kind of music animals like, rock and roll or classical. I think they like the beats. <laughs> can they give them uh, iPads now so they can? Touch if you gave it. a rhesus monkey an iPad, it would just throw it across the room and break it. <laughs> yeah. So even like for the Wisconsin part sorting test, it has to be anchored to a device, a wall with bars in front of it. So it yeah. can't throw its canine's teeth into it or damage it or break it. But um, yeah, so it's more like um, gross manipulation skills with the toys and it, it has to mimic foraging. They spend most of their time in the wild, monkeys do foraging for food. So the stuff I showed you is more along the lines of throwing pumpkins around and food puzzles and things like that. They don't really play, they don't play video games, except for the Wisconsin card sorting test if it's part of a research project to test their healthy cognition through shape choosing. Good questions. Yes. Is there a site on the website? Um, for the public to access the types of diseases that are being researched, or that on the future docket of any sort. On the and um, yeah, on our primate center website, if you go to primate.wisc.edu, the the ones that we're studying recently that we have discoveries about are in the news. We kind of keep a running column, and then we also have um, that's the home page. And then if you go to our main menu and you click on our science, you'll find, this is um, interesting, um, scientific journal articles. So I searched PubMed and I put all the primate supported scientific journal articles. And some of them I have to read 12 times. So I understand them. Others are a little more obvious, but that's for the actual published, peer reviewed published literature on what we're studying. And then we also have under our science, um, our discoveries. And I have lists of, you know, bulleted items of what we've discovered over the last 60 years, kind of timelines and things like that. So it's mostly under the Our Science menus, 
that's like the second bullet. I think it's um, the Primate Center um, homepage, a lot of news and stuff, and then the menu, our science. Next to that is our services. So you can read about the whole world of Primate Center support system. And then we have an outreach page with uh, more virtual activities for schools, teachers, and uh, hopefully, like I said, we'll be back in person with our group soon. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. So if one of your scientists has a publication for peer review, what type of publication would it be in? Um, we've recently published in Nature Medicine, okay. Science, Public Library of Science, um, you know, the high impact journals, because not everybody can do whatever they want to a monkey. You know, it's so expensive to research macaques that you only get funded if you really have a good grant going that you'll probably build on another study and publish something. And because it has, is NIH funded public taxpayer money research, we mostly publish in these high impact journals, um, the nature of the science. But there's other ones too, like um specialty journals there might be a journal of i don't know polycystic ovary disease but endocrinology right and some of those other ones because the, the there are so many journals academic journals out there it's amazing how many oh there there's new ones all the time yes. it's i've seen some really interesting titles lately that i didn't know existed before i'm trying to find uh find our Safari, I guess. And then stem cells, of course. Stem cells at WISC.edu is another site to check out. And I was with that center for 15 years. Um, so, so here's our website, news, science. Education and outreach are separate because education is about students. We're not a degree granting department at UW Madison, but we collaborate with you know School of Veterinary Medicine, neuroendocrinology program, and um, all the other programs: zoology, genetics, cell and regenerative biology. So I'm I'm a photographer. I love taking photos too. It's fun to put these up on the site. Oh, there we go. So the journals, mm -hmm. cellular metabolism, science translational medicine, public library science, Sorry, radiation. <laughs> <laughs> Journal of virology is a big one, of course. Here's one, public library of sciences neglected tropical diseases. Mm -hmm. Just did a, I read that paper and I thought it was cool. So I wrote a story on it, which is now posted on our news site. They were studying whether people who had dengue virus were worried that women who had dengue virus um, and then get a Zika infection, if the dengue will create enhancement of the Zika infection, which is bad. So we tested that in our monkeys and found it wasn't really anything to worry about which is good for, you know, as people are developing more vaccines for dengue and Zika, we wanna make sure one virus doesn't enhance the other and then affect what kind of vaccine is gonna be effective or not. Nature Communications, American Journal of Primatology, there's one of the wild, wild monkey studies. So yeah. There we go. <laughs> There's a lot. I think we've had 60 or 70 this year already. So go ahead. How far along is the research on retinal cells and macular They are in clinical trials. Really? So yeah, there are clinical trials, especially for age-related macular degeneration. And like I always say, you gotta ask your doctor. Ask your doctor if you are a candidate. You know, some people are, some people aren't. Um, but that's one that's underway. So, so David Gam has funding from the McPherson Eye Research Institute and private philanthropy too. 
it's not just NIH funding. I really would be remiss if I didn't mention the philanthropy um, foundation, patient foundation money. We've had funding from the Lupus Foundation of America, March of Dimes, Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. So it's mostly NIH, but it's also foundations, philanthropists, um, individuals, and uh, pharmaceutical companies too. Thank you very much.